The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world. In America, the rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome to Sirius XM's Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. In the 1980s and part of the 90s, there were only two words in music that personified a cultural revolution. Hall and Oates. It was a sound that defined a decade and beyond. John Oates and Daryl Hall are the greatest musical duo in the history of rock and pop music. Six number one singles, 20 top 40 hits, 10 number one records six multi-platinum albums, and an induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2014. Not bad for two kids who met in a service elevator after a raucous gig in Philadelphia. In 1967, Hall and Oates were both enrolled at Temple University, and each was in a separate band. They were set to compete in a Battle of the Bands competition at the Adelphia Ballroom in Philadelphia. Two rival gangs were in the crowd, and violence broke out. But trapped backstage, they found themselves crammed into a service elevator together. And the rest was music history. Hit after hit after hit followed as they became the biggest act North America had ever seen. Melodic, pop, rock, soulful. They represented the best of all worlds. But underneath it all, perhaps the foundation of it all, John Oates was pursuing a music career, but also a passion for cars. It started with the first Volvo the band bought while crisscrossing the country and penning new material. And it continued when Hall & Oates owned the music charts, and John had the chance to get his hands on some vehicles he really loved. John was a racer, after all, a kid who grew up karting and wanted to be a race car driver. Music was simply the means to make his car passions come true. But a bad accident ended those racing dreams, and his music ambition continued to soar. He's owned some amazing cars. He's sold some classics. And now, after a hiatus away from sports cars, he's back in putting together a stable of some of the wildest custom Porsches on the planet. A true car guy, Oates is many things. He's passionate about vehicles, he still cares deeply about music, and he's releasing some versions of some old classics. On tour, working his way through America and Europe this summer, he's unplugged and telling stories about the songs he's playing, which even includes some Hall & Oates favorites. John Oates, Hall of Famer, classic car guy, and a man with many stories to tell in 50 years of music on Cars and Culture. Hey everybody, hi, this is John Oates, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. If the worlds of racing, music, and cars had a poster boy, John Oates would be a leading candidate for the cover, I'm sure. John, what a pleasure to talk to you. Welcome into the program. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, take, uh, I'll take any cover I can get on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're going to be hitting the stage here soon. Let's lead off with that. I was happy to see that not only are you uh, releasing music on a monthly basis, uh, What a Wonderful World came out about a couple of weeks ago, but you're also hitting the road and uh, you're going to be in Texas, you're going to be in Michigan, uh, in Ann Arbor, and you're going to be on a German tour. So active is the word for Mr. Oates at this stage. I do like to stay active. I'm definitely going to uh, enjoy this phase of life where I'm still healthy and enough to uh, to travel around and uh, perform. And uh, it's a it's a great uh, it's a great time to be able to uh, do do some fun things and uh, connect with some people I know around the world, which is really uh, interestingly enough the way I book my shows. Yeah, it, let's talk about that. How how do you how did you settle on Germany for? I mean, you're going to be there for um, a bit of a stretch. It's an interesting place. Yeah, well, uh, it, it was it kind of. I have uh, I have some good friends at Porsche in Stuttgart in, in Stuttgart area, um, and also um, I was offered to um, to have a, an opportunity to co headline and open the show for Beth Hart, who's an American blues uh, artist. She's not as popular in America, but she's very very popular in Europe. And I thought it might be fun to play with her, get in front of her audience and see what happens um, with the uh, the ultimate goal would be to be able to go back to Europe with my wife, have a little uh, holiday, play some shows, you know, kind of expand my 
my uh, my footprint, so to speak. And so I went back there in the last fall and it worked out really well. And so now we, we're returning in June. And in addition to playing with her, I'm doing some solo shows. And here again, I'm getting, a, I have a day off in Stuttgart, going to visit the Porsche Museum and uh, hang out with, uh, hopefully with Tony Hatter and Grant Larson, uh, who I've gotten to know pretty well over the years. And uh, yeah, and have some fun while I'm doing it. I think it's actually just the idea is to build a tour around the Stuttgart Museum, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> that was my original excuse. I just didn't didn't tell anybody that. We'll get into that in a little bit, but I want to talk about touring again. How good is it to be back out on the road? I know uh, you, like everybody else, uh, had to take the a couple of years hiatus. Um, you know, given the uh, you know the pandemic and and the effects of all of that. But in front of live crowds, I know you've you've probably missed it uh, just as much as every other artist out there. Yeah, it was an interesting time. The pandemic gave me the opportunity to actually stop touring. And in doing so, it gave me a chance to reflect and re recalibrate uh, in terms of a lot of things that I was doing. Um, and I made some very important, uh, you know, changes and decisions during that period of time. And one of those decisions was that I didn't want to keep living in a hotel and doing these long drawn out, um, you know, tours. And and also, I, I to be honest with you, I was burned out in playing big venues. Daryl and I were playing very, very large arenas and outdoor venues. And as exciting as that is, and as lucrative as it is, it really wasn't that satisfying for me uh, from an artistic point of view. Uh, I wanted to play different types of music. I wanted to reach back into my past and re-explore some of the musical DNA that made me who I am. And um, so I decided to embark on a series of solo shows, which I'm calling An Evening of Songs and Stories. And it's very lean and mean. It's just me and a guitar. And I have a percussionist or sometimes another guitarist with me. Um, and we're, I just kind of stripped, I stripped away all the, all the excess and the artifice. And I just wanted to make it um, really about music, totally organic and about music in its purest form. And so that's what I've been doing. And I've been really enjoying it. Um, it's taken me around the world. And uh, it, there's no end in sight right now. And so it's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, like I said, I just, um, you know, I'm going to see see where this takes me. But uh, right now, I'm really having fun doing this, a whole new approach to playing live. It's interesting, right, John? Because so many artists start out at a young age wanting to fill those arena shows. Sure. And for you to say that you've burned out on it, it actually takes you full circle. It takes you back to when you started, what the music was all about, why you did the music that way, correct? Well, I had to rediscover that in myself. And during the yeah. pandemic, gave me that time that that downtime to reflect and to and to really make some important decisions like how do I want to you know I mean I've been I've been on tour for 50 years I, I know that's, <laughs> that's not possible <laughs> well it is possible because I'm I'm right here to say to say that I'm, I did it and I'm still here so you're, you're still 30 to me John <laughs> Yeah, well, I, me too. <laughs> I think like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, to, the, the kind of, I feel like 50 years is long enough to do anything with, with anybody. <laughs> so, yeah, right. uh, so, so I thought maybe, you know, let's try something different and really did give me an opportunity to reassess and to reimagine and recalibrate. What do you, what's the mix of songs that you play when you're uh, sort of unplugged, if you will? Well, you know, what I realized was uh, my entire my entire persona and my entire uh, public image is pretty much tied up to the uh, tied to the success of Hall and Oates as a commercial entity, as a group with the big hits and the big 80s hits in particular. Um, and, you know, I started playing guitar at six years old. And by the time I met Daryl Hall when I was 19, what I've been playing for 13 years already. Um, so I was fairly well, you know, well developed as a, as a musician, uh, young, but still, you know, I had some, you know, I had a lot of experience by that time. And the music that I was making was really based on uh, the early days of, of what I learned as a child. My parents were of the World War II generation. Um, so their sweet spot was big band music and swing, which I heard at a young age. And also because I'm old enough, I remember that music prior to rock and roll. I actually, you know, I have a memory of music before rock and roll happened, which I think is a unique perspective. Um, as rock and roll began to happen, I was now, you know, five, six years old. I was starting to, you know, listen to Chuck Berry and Elvis and Little Richard and the Everly Brothers and things like that. 
So, you know, so I feel like in, in a sense, my life, my musical life in particular, parallels the, the development of rock and roll from the very beginning. So I, I when I'm doing this uh, acoustic show now, this one man show, I want to, it's basically a musical time trip. Um, I actually start the show by playing a song that my mom taught me when I was three or four years old in the kitchen. And it's a song that was actually written in 1917. And it was recorded in 1942 by Judy Garland it was one of her favorite songs, uh, my mom's favorite songs. And I kind of I, that's kind of sets the table for the type of show I'm doing. And I and I tell people, hey, I'm going to start at the, at the real beginning. And it's not Maneater and it's not Sarah Smile. <laughs> Uh, and that's what I do. And then I go uh, and I and I play songs by the, the people who influenced me, Mississippi John Hurt, Doc Watson, Jimmy Rogers, uh, Curtis Mayfield, you know, Elvis, I'll even do an Elvis song on occasion. Um, and so what I do is I, I kind of take people on this little chronological musical journey. And of course, I end up with my new songs, my new material and and some of the Hall and Oates hits as well. So it's really a chance to. Um, you know, and I tell the backstories, I tell how the songs were written, the unique anecdotes behind some of the, the, the inspirations for the songs. And people really find it interesting. And um, it's really, uh, it's fun to do. And uh, it's completely different from what I do with Daryl. Well, you take them on a journey, right? So uh, you could even talk about how, I believe you wrote Maneater, right? And and originally you wanted to be a reggae song. Yeah, uh, I had come back from Jamaica. I Thinking about reggae, I came up with a hook and I played it as a reggae song. When Daryl and I got together and I played it for him, he really liked the idea, but he thought, you know, that for a Hall and Oates song, reggae probably wasn't the right framework. Um, and it was his idea to change it to a different groove, which was great because uh, I'm glad I listened to him because it was a, actually a fairly successful little ditty. I would say so. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, but that's what collaboration is all about. Collaboration is all about, you know, a uh, an, an initial inspiration and then the uh, the combination of, of, of different influences by by a collaborative partner or other things that that cause something to be greater than the sum of its parts. Well, your story with Daryl actually is hooked around cars, which I'd like to get into because uh, your your car history is a long one, but it was a Volvo PV 544 yes. that actually brought you guys somewhat together because after you met in the service elevator, if I have that correct, uh, trapped backstage in Philadelphia, um, uh, the, the Adelphi ballroom, right, John? Mm -hmm. And, um, and all of a sudden you meet Daryl Hall and your, your roommates later and you begin, you began the stage of gigging together, but you needed a vehicle to pack instruments and gear and, Something was a little different than an average big domestic car or truck. So you get into a Volvo and the story <laughs> begins. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, we weren't really gigging. What we were doing is we were just, we're just being hippies messing around. Uh, you know, <laughs> we were, I, I found the Volvo. I thought it was really cool. It reminded me of a 40 Ford uh, in terms of its shape. And um, we used to go and we'd play like a coffee house and it would just be me with a guitar and, and he would bring a little electric piano with him and we would stuff it into the back. Uh, I remember I had a very interesting little anecdote about that car. We're coming back from Boston. We had must, must have gone to Boston to do something. And we're coming back to Philadelphia and Boston. We're coming down the interstate and all of a sudden smoke starts to come out from the dashboard. And, and we're like, oh my God. So we pull over to the side of the road, jump <laughs> out of the car. The smoke dissipates get back in the car, everything works fine. And we kept on driving. I don't know what happened. Some wire. minor blip. <laughs> yes. Yeah, little, little minor, minor, you know, uh, problem, but uh, it was kind of funny. It was maybe a testament to the, uh, the Volvo, you know, the, the solid build of the Volvo. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. No kidding. But w the car story continues. You officially become a duo. You produce a record, you start touring and you had a enough success to buy your parents GTO. Tell me, <laughs> tell me about that moment. <laughs> that was the greatest. Um, I had convinced my parents that it was just a more expensive Tempest. <laughs> and um, you know, they had no idea what a GTO was. I knew exactly what it was. I was actually, my girlfriend's father was the um, general manager of the local Pontiac dealer. So we went over there. I convinced them to get the GTO. It was yellow with a black vinyl top. Uh, it was an automatic. It had the Hearst uh, automatic. And um, yeah, Daryl and I went on tour uh, with that GTO all up and down the East Coast 
and we put five people in it. It was the three band members plus Daryl and I. I drove, Daryl sat in the passenger seat in the front and the three band members, and they always had to draw straws for the hump, whoever got the hump in the, in the middle. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was during the gas crisis when, you know, you I don't know if you recall, but you could only buy gas on odd and even days based on the number of your license plate, the end number of your license plate. Sure. Right. So it was the weirdest thing. We were down south, I remember, and our tour manager, our road manager, we'd be on stage and before midnight, he would lead, he would jump in the car while we were still playing and he'd go out and fill the car with gas because the next day we <laughs> needed the gas to get to wherever we were going. No way. It was crazy. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. So, and But we, we drove that car all up and down the East Coast. That, that was really cool. It was a, a, a serious adventure. And that's why, I have, uh, that's why I have such fond memories of the early 70s, because everything was new. It was exciting. It was every city was new. Every person you met was new. Uh, the venues were new. You know, it was, it was a great time to be, be um, on tour. The first sports car you ever saw was a Porsche. Yes. And we're going to talk about your your love for the brand, but it was at Bob Holbert's garage in Pennsylvania. Yeah, Is that right? right? Warrington, PA. Yeah. I, I grew up in a little town called North Wales, which was probably about eight miles from Warrington. Um, and I remember my dad, when I was really young, taking me uh, over there. Uh, and I, the first sports car I ever saw was a Porsche. There, he was a Volkswagen uh, Porsche dealer. And uh, I remember seeing it and uh, I had never seen a sports car. I didn't know what a sports car was. I was really young. Um, and maybe that left an indelible impression. I'm not 100 percent sure. But um, eventually, you know, and over the years, you know, um, you know, the, the Holbert, obviously the Holbert racing legacy and the Holbert uh, connection to Porsche is uh, obviously internationally known, very strong. But it was really uh, it was a way that kind of a. Uh, you know, kind of, I guess, I guess it just uh, tweaked my interest in some way or another. Captivated you and has, and has captivated you for a long yeah. time. But I, I want to ask first about the Renault because you, you, <laughs> right. You convinced your parents that actually the Renault was the vehicle that they needed to buy this little French odd rear engine vehicle. And you had your driver's license and you're driving around town in your parents' Renault with the muffler removed. <laughs> <laughs> a muffler came off with a U-bolt, literally one U-bolt. <laughs> All you had to do was take two, two nuts off, take the U-bolt off and pull it down. And it just came right off. And yeah, we used to go around. It was really loud and obnoxious. And the best part was the city horn and the country horn, which was this little plastic switch <laughs> on, the, on the steering column. And it went beep, beep, boop, boop. And actually they advertised they ever, that was one of the selling points of this car that it had a city horn and a country horn. Uh, it, you know what? I needed a little car in high school to drive around. I loved European cars. I always loved small, lightweight cars and uh, convinced them that that was a good idea. Uh, and uh, it was fun. Amazing. Your racing career, you know, I found it very fascinating, John, to know that you learned on Formula Fords at Brands Hatch uh, in, in the UK. And uh, was, that the, was that the pathway? Did you really want to be a race car driver? The pathway for me was go karts. Um, as so many race drivers, you know, it's usually the, the learning the learning uh, curve for most race drivers. Um, I I was uh, living in New York City, vacationing out in the Hamptons, out on Long Island, and um, one day I remember just driving around the back roads. I saw the sign that said go kart races, and uh, it How was old a, you? I was probably twenty two, maybe some twenty three. Okay. No, no, I was more like 25 because um, it was like the 76, 77. Uh, and um, so, I, yeah, so I, I just literally pulled in and all of a sudden these, I saw these carts zipping around and on this, you know, on this little tiny road course. And I was like, wow, this is great. And uh, I started talking to people. I said, how do you do this? They say, buy a cart and show up. And it was as simple as that. Um, I made some friends with a guy who had a little race team on Long Island. He was an engine builder and. Uh, got a cart and he kind of talked me through the basics and uh, I I started enjoying it. And then I had a good friend in England, a guy named Richard Lloyd, who did, um, he started out with a company called GTI Engineering, racing uh, uh, Volkswagen GTIs in the British Saloon Car Championship. Uh, then he transitioned to Porsches and he had a very famous 956 and 962 uh, Canon with Canon livery on it. It was a very well-known car. 
Uh, and uh, Richard was a music fan and I was a race fan. It was a marriage made in heaven. And we uh, we bonded. And uh, I told him, you know, that I wanted to learn how to race. And he was racing actively at the time. And he hooked me up at Brands Hatch and I went there for the weekend and got into Formula Ford for the first time. And it was it was an eye opening. And I was like, OK, this is great. And I finished their their little two day school and then eventually went back to the U.S. and, and enrolled in the uh, Bertel Roos uh, Racing School up at Pocono. We were classmate with John Andretti. With John, John was in my class. Michael had finished the year before me, and I ended up driving the same car that Michael had driven, uh, and I got my SCCA license in that car. Um, it was it was actually a Ford that a Formula Ford that Bertel Roos had built himself. Okay, uh, it was his own own car. It was a kind of a one off. Uh, yeah, and that's what got me started. And eventually, I did some Ford races, and then I did. I didn't like the idea of the open wheel racing. I kind of soured on that pretty quick, and I moved into the sports two thousands, um, which was you know a full full bodied car with a two thousand cc um, Ford engine, and it was there was a Pro Series, an SCCA Pro Series, which I did for two years in a row, um, which was fun, and uh, tra- you know did all the tracks all around the East Coast and the Midwest. At the same time, uh, you get introduced to Sir Jackie Stewart and John Surtees by a gentleman named George Harrison. (laughs) Right. Well, believe it or not, no, not quite. Uh, Sir Jackie introduced me to George. Oh, Sir Jackie introduced you to George. Yes. Um, I met met Jackie uh, through um, Rupert Keegan, who was driving Formula One for John Surtees um, at the time. And Rupert was the bad boy of Formula One way, you know, uh, around the the the, the Hesketh, uh, you know, time, uh, but Rupert uh, Rupert was probably were a lot more of a bad boy than James Hunt was. It's just people didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's put it this way: Rupert Rupert's sponsor on his car was uh, Durex, which, oh, okay. which was a condom company. Right. So <laughs> let's, just, let's just use that as a. You can follow that as far as you want. That's the baseline. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, Rupert introduced me to Jackie. Then Jackie introduced me to George. Um, I have a picture of George and I at the at the um, Long Beach Grand Prix in '77, I think it was. Um, How special was that for you? Uh, well, you know, of course, meeting I mean, a, meeting a Beatle, of course, you know, it was a, a very very special. You know, I wasn't a huge Beatle fan, to be honest with you, and maybe that's what made it more comfortable because. There was no agenda for me. I wasn't in, in awe. I, I wasn't in awe of that. Uh, I just, you know, I just like George as a person. Um, he was a race fan. Uh, he was down to earth. He was funny and, and cool. He was living in L.A. at the time. Uh, so we got to hang out. And actually, I invited George to play on uh, an album that Daryl and I were making in 78 called Along the Red Ledge. And George graciously uh, came to the studio and played on that. Uh, so we, we, you know, and I went to Friar Park, he invited me to his, his place in England, which was an amazing experience. Uh, so, um, yeah, and he was, he was great. And, uh, so Jackie and and his family, we've been friends since, since the seventies. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I watched his kids grow up and been very, I'm really good friends with Mark and Paul, the two, two sons and their families. So yeah, it's been a great, great experience. Around the time that Hall and Oates are working their way through Germany uh, and and Europe, you put a call in to get a factory tour at Porsche. So yeah, uh, it's it's funny how things come around, right, John? Yeah. And and there's a special what what's known as the special wishes program. And what did you decide that you wanted to spec out at that point? I mean, you 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 had the means, you love the brand, and now you wanted something that was your own. Well, uh, yes, uh, everything you said is correct. One thing I would add to that is that I I bought my first Porsche before that. I bought a 77 930 Turbo. Okay. I bought that in Beverly Hills, um, which has a story unto itself. Maybe we should wind Tell me that. clock back a little bit. Um, I was driving through Beverly Hills on Wilshire Boulevard past Beverly Hills Porsche, which is no longer there, but it was at the time. Uh, and in the window, I saw the nose of a red no, 911 and I thought it was the new turbo because th- that was all the rage in those days that was the supercar of the, of the era right and um I didn't know for sure so I pulled in and I took a look at it and it was it was a 930 it was uh it was guards red and and it had yellow it had gold BBS wheels so mm. it was super flashy 
Uh, so I went back, told my manager what I'd seen. He goes, let's go down and take a look. So we went down. He ended up buying a 356 Cabriolet that belonged to Sonny Bono. And huh. we went in and we found out that the turbo had a deposit. Rod Stewart had put a deposit on it. And the salesman said, told, told us that Rod Stewart had a deposit on it. My manager said, let me talk to this guy. I took him back into the back room. I don't know exactly what he said, but I ended up buying it. Uh, and <laughs> It was amazing. And I, I drove that car back from L.A. to New York. Then I drove it back from New York back to uh, to L.A. again. Uh, and that was two of the greatest road trips I've ever taken in that 930. Um, so that was my first that was my first Porsche. But then to fast forward to 1983. Uh, yes, I was on tour in Germany. Richard Lloyd, who I had mentioned earlier, he was racing the 956s and the 962s at the time. Uh, and he made a call to the factory and told them I was coming and I'd like to get a VIP factory tour, which I did. Uh, and then we went into a little room. I actually didn't even know I was going to order a car. I didn't even think about it, to be honest with you, until I got there. And then I realized, you know what, maybe I need to take advantage. Of it. I didn't I had no idea about special wishes. I believe special wishes had started maybe a year or two before, but it was really pretty obscure. People weren't it wasn't something that people did. It wasn't offered through the dealerships or anything like that. And I remember going into a room with a guy, and I had no idea who the guy was. Um, it might have been Tillman Bob Breck, uh, who Ray Schaefer uh, kind of helped me identify. It might have been him. Um, and we sat down at a small desk. It was so low key. It was just he and I. He started bringing out some brochures and, and pamphlets, and we started looking through things. And the not, the, the Carrera, uh, the 3.2 Carrera was about to be introduced in, in 84. Uh, the SC, SC was being, you know, done away with and the, the new Carrera. And I knew it was a new engine, and I knew, you know, there, that it looked like a really nice, nice package. And I thought, okay. So at the time, I don't know if you recall or not, but, you know, the Group B rally cars were all done in pearl white and some of their show cars were done pearl white. It's a very, a very 80s color, you know? Right. <laughs> the and pearl being, white exterior. Oh, yeah. And being the and 80s, interior. Yes. And being the 80s guy that I was, um, I said, let's go with pearl white. Um, so we picked a color. And then uh, I did the interior in Mercedes leather because I thought the Mercedes had nicer quality leather at the time. Dove gray uh, leather, in fact. Dove, it was dove gray, light gray. Um, and uh, then we started adding all these really cool things like a front air dam from the RS cars, um, uh, limited slip diff, uh, black headliner, little things. Uh, we, we Steering wheel from the flat nose uh, uh, turbos, uh, turbo seats. So it really was kind of a really cool customization at the time. And uh, the car was then delivered in 84 to a New York dealer for me, and which I had. And I sold it uh, around 1991. Um, and my wife and I found it on an online auction two years ago and bought it back. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that end of the story. Yeah. And we have it right now. And it's uh, it only has 40,000 miles on it. And um, the two pre prior, the two owners in between me and and me again, um, really took care of it. They didn't change a thing. It's uh, the only thing was gone was the BBS wheels, which was okay. Uh, but other than that, it's a totally stock and original, and um, it's still a great car. I, to be honest with you, I'm not a fan of the G body cars uh, after all these years. Um, but uh, it, it's still a, it's a. You know, it's more of a memento for my, me and my wife, really, at this point. Well, and and what a nod to your to your past and the and and where you were in your life at that point. Yeah. Uh, can I ask just one more thing about the racing and and a story about the Pontiac Fiero? Huh. Uh, in fact, the Fiero GTU, and um, you were offered a seat in the vehicle. The car was a monster, right? Um, it was, it was. Wide flares, stubby wheelbase, punched yeah. out three liter. Four yeah. cylinder making almost 400 horsepower. What happened in that vehicle, John? Well, um, I had raced a few IMSA long distance races in the uh, Porsche 924 GTR, a Richard Lloyd's car uh, in at Daytona with him co driving, and then with a guy named George Drolson, who recently passed away uh, in George's car at Lime Rock. And we shared a co drive with him. So I had some experience in, in doing some IMSA races. And at the time, Daryl and I were being sponsored on tour by Pontiac, and they were introducing the Fiero, and they wanted to make, you know, it was a youthful, you know, new concept, a, a mid-engine car for, a, you know, a GM manufacturer it was a pretty, you know, pretty uh, 
forward looking. It was pretty cool at the time. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Um, you know, the stock the stock street version wasn't that that great, uh, you know, but it was all right. Um, and and anyway, the so they had decided, obviously, you know, as as all brands do, racing to uh, you know, racing the car to to you know to put it on the map uh in people's minds. And uh it was built, it was a totally uh, I mean, it looked kind of like a Fiero, but it was a, it was a full out race car, uh, full out, you know, uh, and it was built by Joe Huffaker out in California, very well known builder. And Bob Earl was the principal driver and Bob Earl was a great driver. Uh, the car, as you said, it was a very short wheelbase with a lot of power. It was very, very twitchy, not easy to drive. And to be honest with you, I had really no time, no practice time in it. I, I went out to California and I tested it. Uh, because I guess they wanted to make sure I didn't want to, wasn't going to kill myself. Little did they know. But um, I, I tested it at Sears Point, and I did okay. I did okay enough to the point where they thought, okay, this guy can drive this thing. So um, we went off to uh, – Bob had put that car on the pole in almost every IMSA race, and had won a bunch of them. The car was really fast. Uh, and like, as I said, Bob was a great driver. Uh, we went to Road, uh, Road, uh, Road America in, in Wisconsin, and um, Bob put the car, I think he was second, to the factory Toyotas, which were really fast at the time, Dan, Dan Gurney's team. And this was in the GTU category, under two liter category. And uh, so, they, so I, they decided that I would start the race, and um, Bob had it, had it up front uh, on the grid, started the race, and I was a bit, you know, I was trying to be cautious. And I dropped back probably around fourth or something like that, fifth. And I was motoring around, you know, kind of holding my own. And I figured if I could just get in, you know, Bob would take care of the, the second stint and probably win the race. Um, and it was right near the time when I was supposed to come in uh, to, to change drivers. And uh, I don't know if you know Road America very well, but there's a turn called the carousel. Sure. And after the carousel, there's a thing called the kink, which is a pretty much a flat out quick left-hander um it's and uh right as i was approaching the kink i heard a popping sound and I, I i think i found out later that it was the transmission or the rear end locking up and um that all i remember is a big bang and i don't remember anything after that and then i woke up in the ambulance on the way to the hospital and so uh, I was knocked out. Luckily, I went over the Armco guardrail, but I didn't hit a tree. And the car was kind of suspended on the guardrail. Um, and uh, woke up, uh, you know, and they checked me out at the hospital, said, you have a mild concussion. You're OK. Go home. <laughs> and, <laughs> things were a little different then. <laughs> things, were, things were different in those days. And I remember I went, I went back to the track. Um, race was over. I got in my rental car. And I I drove to the Milwaukee airport and flew, flew back to New York. <laughs> so um, that, but that was the end of my Jeez. race. I decided I wasn't going to race. Anymore. That was it. But I've done a lot of track days. I've done a lot of, uh, I still drive some go-karts on occasion. Uh, and I've done some real, really, you know, fun track days where I've driven a bunch of really cool cars. Are you a good race car driver? I could have been, uh, had I, had I given it a professional effort, I was in a professional series and not giving it a professional effort. I, w I wasn't testing. I wasn't practicing. I was just showing up and driving. So considering that I did okay. Yeah. I, I always felt I was a good driver, but like I said, I didn't, didn't have enough time and experience to really see how good I could be. Are you more passionate about cars now, John, or racing? Um, more passionate about cars. Um, I, I still love racing. I still have a lot of friends in the racing you know, biz. You know, I know the, the I know a lot of the indie car. You know, Michael Michael Andretti and Chip Ganassi and and the Penskes. You know, I've I've grown up with all those guys. And so You're uh, friends with Danny but, Sullivan too. Oh, and Danny, yeah, of course, yeah. Danny Sullivan's one of my best friends. And yep. uh, just uh, you know, it's it, 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 the racing fraternity is a great group of people. They there's no there's no bullshit. They um, you know they. And I always love that, that, you know, the old saying, you know, when the green flag drops, the bullshit stops. Right. And, it, you know, you can take that as a, as a metaphor for life because it's true. Um, you know, in racing, you're either quick or you're not, you know, <laughs> you can complain. Yeah, it's pretty binary. Yeah. You can complain and say you don't have the, the equipment or you had a problem. Or, but in the end, you know, you either got to deliver or not. And I like that. I, it appeals to my, my sensibility, uh, you know, even in music, you know, you, you have to deliver in one way or the other. 
But um, yeah, and I've got uh, just like I said, I've had friends for years and years. And over the years, um, I started getting involved with the uh, more the vintage side of, of the car, the car culture and um, had a car built by Rod Emery. And Rod introduced me to Kevin Jeanette, who's a, you know, a very well-known vintage Porsche repairer, restorer, racer. And um, so he, they all kind of got, they, I swung, I swung back into the, uh, into the, their car and racing thing and uh, had some great experiences with those guys too. Well, let's talk about Emery and let's talk about you turning 70 and Porsche turning 70. You yeah. had a bit of a light bulb moment. You said, gosh, this great brand that I love so much yes. has a really <laughs> special birthday coming up. And so do I. Yes. <laughs> so let's marry the worlds together, right? Yeah, you know, 1948 was the first Porsche, and 1948 was the first John Oates. Meant so, to be. So um, I thought, I thought, you know, as as a special birthday gift to myself, I said, you know what, I've got custom guitars, I've got some custom clothes made, uh, you know, I, I built a house, it was kind of custom. I thought, why not a custom car? And uh, I was out in LA, and you know, as we all do, you know, sur- surfing the surfing the car the car sites on the web. Uh, and I ran across the uh, Rod Emery, Emery Motorsports and his outlaws. And I looked at them and I thought, wow, these are beautiful cars. I didn't know anything about them. And uh, there was a phone number and I, I had a day off in Los Angeles. I called him up. Rod picked up the phone and I introduced myself and I said, hey, you mind if I come out and see your shop? And he said, yeah, come on out. And I went out and um, I actually, my, the drum, my drummer and I, he was a car guy too. We took a ride out there in our rental car and we got out and, you know, I started looking around. Rod started showing me what he does and how he does it and a little history of his family. And I was really, I was really completely enamored with everything that was going on. And then he said, do you want to take one out for a ride? And I said, sure. And um, so I got in one of the cars and uh, he drove it down the block. We went down near where Jay Leno has his, his garages by the Burbank airport uh, we didn't go too far. And uh, then he said, you can drive it back. And I hopped in the seat and I drove it back. And I was like, wow, okay. And I said, this is amazing. And I got back and I, we, I remember we pulled into the into, back into the shop and my drummer was standing there and he looked at me, he says, you're going to buy one of these, aren't you? I said, yeah, I think I am. <laughs> and so that, that's how it started. Um, and then I told Rod that I had a 56 Speedster uh, back in the 80s. Um, and it was the only car that I regretted selling. Uh, it was a silver speech there with a red interior. And I said, look, I don't want to recapture my past. I don't want another speedster, but I want something that gives me that same feeling. And we started collaborating. We started talking about what it could be and how it could be. And the, the work, uh, the collaboration with Rod was one of the mo- my favorite things I've ever done. It took, uh, you know, two and a half years. And we spoke all the time on the phone. I probably went to the shop once a month to see the car as it had developed and evolved. And he taught me everything about what he was doing. Uh, I learned about his, we got to meet his family, great family. And I, you know, I, I understood what I loved about Rod was how he approached things. You know, he has a, he, he, he comes from a hot Southern California, hot rod background, his grandfather, you know, and father were both, especially his grandfather. They were the early, you know, customizers channeling and chopping and things like that. Uh, but then he had this love of Porsche. So he combines this Southern California hot rod aesthetic with the, the reverence for the Porsche brand, which is really a cool combination. And I love that. Um, and what, you know, what he turned out for me is spectacular. It's, it's a, everyone who sees this car loses their minds. It's a, I think it's, you know, I, I'm a little prejudiced, but I think it's one of the most beautiful cars ever made. I really do. And I, I'll put it up against anything. When you incorporated what you considered to really be the best qualities, right, of the 356 as it evolved through the years. Well, I wanted a greatest hits. Yeah, what, there you go. <laughs> that's what I wanted. I, I said, I said, well, let's make the best of the best. The car had a, the, the original car he found in Texas, and it was a true barn find. It actually was in a barn, and it had hornet's nests in it. And it was a mess. Uh, the front end had been stove in. It had hit a tree or a telephone pole. It was wrecked, right? What's that? It was wrecked. Yeah, it was wrecked. It had to, the front end was pushed in. Um, and so right off the bat, Rod said, I'm going to have to put a new front end clip on this thing. And it was a B Cabriolet with a, with a removable hardtop. And that removable hardtop, I don't know if you, you, you probably know, but very kind of upright and kind of yep. not very attractive, to be honest with you. 
He said, but that's a valuable piece. He said, we're going to do something with that too. Um, but I said, well, Rod, if you're going to have to replace the front end and, you know, we're not trying for, you know, we're try not trying for authenticity here. I said, um, I love the front end, the, the, the nose of the A, A, the A models is much sleeker and much more, it's much sexier. Um, the B models, the, 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 the headlights were more raised up. The tunnels were a little bit higher, um, not quite as, as sleek. And I said, why don't you put an A nose on it? You know, he said, yeah, we can do that. So uh, that's how it started. And then from there, I said, come on, let's just pick the best of the best. You know, it's got the it's got the Lexan pull up windows of the uh, of the the uh, race cars. It's got uh, the door panels from the Roadster. Um, it's got the seat, the Speedster seats. Uh, it's it's just and then he chopped the top and made made it a thing of beauty. He really the, the work that he did, the metal work was just so artistic. And as I learned about what he was going to do and how he was doing, I was just I became more and more impressed. Uh, he he just really poured a lot into this car. Uh, and then a special a special paint code that it's funny. He says to this day uh, he gets a request once a week for that paint code, and he won't give it to anyone. Uh, it's uh, so um, the John Oates collection is what it is, right? It's, a, it's one a, and only. It started out as graphite metallic, which is a fifties uh, color, but uh, that was a kind of a yellow, uh, kind of a bluish gray uh, cast. But what we did is we he he combined it with a gold and a black. And it's this so unique color. And everyone, literally everyone sees the car. The first thing they say is, just, what is that color? Uh, because it's totally unique. What are you collecting now? I know you spent a good amount of time. Uh, well, you got rid of a lot of things. And you were driving a truck in Colorado for, for a long yeah. time. <laughs> but yeah, you're, I, kind of, I kind of got out of the car thing for a while while I was in Colorado. Although but I you're restocking. Build, I, built, I built a hot rod A4 while I was out in Colorado uh, with a big turbo and a MTM uh, stage two tune on it. That was kind of fun. But uh, now, now I'm in Nashville. And, and when I moved to Nashville, I didn't realize that Nashville has a really healthy car culture. And I started meeting all these guys um, who were collectors. And I kind of just got back into it. Uh, bought, a, bought an Alpha Spider, which is always one of my favorite cars. Um, and it started there. And, and of course, I had the Emery car. And I have an I have an MGA twin cam, a '59 twin cam, which is a really rare car, and uh, this is a, a national uh, concours winner. It's um, it's won numerous uh, events around the country, uh, and that's a fun car. It's my actually my one of my wife's favorite cars because she likes to go slow with the top down, so uh, <laughs> it, it's great. Uh, and then I just bought Ray Schaefer's uh, 964 Turbo. I don't know if Ray told you. Which yes, is, indeed. Yeah, yeah, he did. That's his baby. That was it, his it baby. is his baby. Yeah, exactly. It's your baby now. Well, what happened was, and here again, I had no, you know, I had always admired that car because, you know, I knew Ray had really, you know, he just loved that car. And uh, I'd seen it, you know, many times at Amelia Island and various other places. And I was out in Indianapolis uh, last year to do a concert um, in Indianapolis. And there was a big Porsche event at the track, at the 500 track. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Ray Schaefer had a um, Porsche Classic uh, display going on, and I had I had a, an afternoon off, so I took a ride to the track, went to see Ray. I walked into the Porsche Classic tent. We talked for a bit. And he goes, "Hey, I want to show you something." And he took me over and showed me these nine uh, nine forty four race cars, spec cars, and he said, "I really I want to go racing." He goes, "I because I'd love to get one of these cars and race." He goes. He goes, but I, he goes, I, I probably have to sell my turbo. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> and, and I said, what are you going to do with it? He goes, well, I'm thinking, you know, I've been talking about putting it up in the auction and, and, and all that stuff. And he goes, there's one guy who's kind of interested. And I said, well, if you really decide you're going to sell it, please call me because I could make it a lot easier for you than, than an auction. Uh, hmm. and that's what happened. He decided to, to go racing and buy that car. Uh, I bought the 964 Turbo, and it is, if you've seen it, you know it's a very special car. It's a very special car. He talked about it being a very special car on this on this program. Yeah. And I, I to be honest with you, I, I, you know, I know a lot about Porsches, but I didn't really know the real subtleties of, of how interesting the 964 model was. To me, it's the first step Porsche to be a, become a modern car. It has things like ABS. Uh, it has air, airbags. It has, um, you know, uh, it just um, there's. It, it's kind of like an in-between car, you know. The, 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 after the G bodies, 
this was kind of, okay, we're going to step into the future here. It's an interesting car. It still has the 930 turbo engine, but with a lot of refinements. And since I had a 930, I kind of expected it to drive like that. And it actually doesn't. It's much more refined. They they tweak the they tweak something in the turbo in the electronics that makes the turbo a lot less like an on and off switch, which with 930 was kind of pretty pretty dramatic. You know, it was either nothing or something, and that something was pretty big. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah. But the 964 was much more refined. Uh, the turbo comes on very smoothly. It's a uh, and it's just it, it's just a great car. And you know, it's the last of the hand built Porsches. After that, they went to a much more automated uh, production system. Manufacturing system, yeah. Hand welded, hand seam welded, mm-hmm. hand built. So really, there's a lot of a uh, lot of interesting features on that car. Um, and I'm really enjoying driving it. Let's end on some music questions. You ever written a car song, John? Yeah, I wrote a song called Let's Drive. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> How's that for being uh, obvious? Um <laughs> It's on an album I did uh, in mid two thousands called "Good Road to Follow." Okay, all right. Uh, let me ask you about artificial intelligence and music. Wow, you, you, uh, you, you I, I've been going down the rabbit hole on YouTube on this. All right, I, tell me a little bit about how you feel about AI and uh, Chat GBT and the creation of songs. And um, if I can plug I into, was, yeah, I, go ahead. I don't know. I, I really don't have, you know, obviously far be it from me to be able to predict the future. But all I know is that I, I have fear. I have a certain fear about technology, um, not in terms of the, you know, the robots taking over, uh, although that might happen. Um, <laughs> but I, I think about, you know, I think about it in terms of what is it going to do to the younger generations coming along? You know, it, it will will there be any reason for kids to go to school? Um, because if you can find every answer that you want immediately from a, from a, a source like an AI type source, and if you only have a narrow um, sphere of interest, you are not going to be a very well-rounded person. Um, you may not know anything about anything other than what you want to know about. And I, I'm curious to see whether that kind of starts to you know affect the way kids learn the way um, the whole concept of traditional schooling, I think could be, could be completely shattered. Um, and I, I just saw something on the news where they said that the election of 2024 will be the last human election. Meaning that by that, by the time the next election rolls around, AI will have influ- infiltrated itself to such a degree in the political system and in, in the awareness of people that um, there that elections can be manipulated solely by information alone. Hmm. So so I have mixed feelings about it. I did I did I did experiment with Jet Chat GPT and I said uh, write a write a John Oates song about a beach and a girl and a nice sunny day. And in three seconds there were five verses. It wow. was crazy. It was really crazy. Were they good verses? They weren't bad. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say they were good, but they weren't bad. Listen, they weren't, you know, it wasn't Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan, that's for sure. But, uh, but it, it was. It wasn't uh, John Oates. No, well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, I, hate, I hate to admit it, but maybe. Um, but no, it was, uh, you know, just the fact that it happened was enough to get my attention, you know? Yeah, certainly. Would we ever find you at a honky tonk on Broadway in Nashville on a Wednesday night sitting in with a local band? Nope. No, you won't do it. I've done it. I've already done it. You done it. This is it's a little little too um a little too alcoholic for my taste. <laughs> what do you think of modern music these days? Anything you like? Yeah, I like a lot of stuff. Uh, there's some great pop music being made. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, you know, uh let's see. I like Harry Styles. I like I like the pop that he's making, which to me reminds me of the 80s in in a way. Um I don't know. Let's see. Uh, there's so much. I don't know even where to start. Uh, but I love everything. You know, I, I'm not a. I'm not tied to genres. I don't. You know, I I like Americana. You know, I, I like uh, I like the stuff that Billy Strings is doing. The way he's taking uh, you know kind of traditional bluegrass and Americana to a whole youth more youthful uh, level and approach. Um, 
And uh, you know, and I still, I still like, uh, I still like the old traditional R and B. You know, uh, I love vocal harmonies and things like that. I'm, I'm definitely waving the flag for the old school musicians. You know, uh, yeah, I, I like people who can play their instruments and sing songs. Yeah, there you go. One final thing: if we see you either at the Ark in Ann Arbor or in Germany, in Mannheim, or anywhere else around the country, will we hear "She's Gone" or "I Can't Go for That" or "Out of Touch," "Man Eater"? All the above. I mean, those are some of your favorites, right? You won't hear. Uh, you won't hear. I can't go for that because it's a very difficult song to pull off with an acoustic guitar without a group. <laughs> I can imagine. Although I play, she's gone every night. I don't think I've ever played a professional show in my life, whether it's with Daryl or without him, uh, without playing that song. But it, that song is a. Um, it's timeless. Song, it is. It's timeless, and it's really a. Um, it's just. A, it's something that that's to me represents what the the best of of Hall and Oates uh, in terms of the circumstance in writing it the the, the finished product uh, everything about it is is just as as right as it can be um and I do I, I I'm actually releasing a reggae version of Maneater which I cut in Jamaica uh, there you go it's finally going to happen it's finally going to happen actually it comes out in um it's coming out May 17th actually 2 weeks from now uh, it'll be out. Uh, and I, I went to Jamaica and cut it with some reggae all-stars who played with Bob Marley and Toots and the Maytals and people like that. So um, it's really cool that that, that's going to finally see the light of day. And I'm releasing a series of streaming singles. I have uh, one, one a month that's been coming out. So this will be the fifth. Uh, and uh, some originals, some covers, and uh, all sorts of stuff. And then there's a movie that just came out called Gringa. Which I did the uh, I did five of the uh, of the pop songs in the movie, and uh, it's a great little movie about a young girl from Southern California who goes to Mexico to find her father, and uh, that was fun. So those songs are coming out as well. And I think we'll look for that car song now that you've mentioned it. Let's yeah. drive. I think you should make that your theme song. <laughs> I think I should too. John, thank you so much for the time. You can see John on tour this summer, either in Europe or in America. And of course, as he said, on his own YouTube channel, there's one song being released every month, including finally the original version, how it should have been of Man Eater <laughs> in the reggae yeah. style. Only, only the people will let, let me know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> John, thank you so much for being on Cars and Culture. You are both. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. That was a great thank interview. You. Thank you. Thanks to my guest today, musician and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, John Oates. And to see my interview with John, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to see more than 100 interviews. And thanks for listening to Cars and Culture. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as on Instagram at Cars and Culture SXM and on Twitter at Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. We'll see you down the road. <laughs>